Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Jewish sage Maimonides from the 12th century said throughout the first and second temples there were nine red heifers. He said the tenth would signal the appearance of the Messiah. That's why many are excited about this arrival. These are the red heifers that landed at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport. Rabbis believe the ashes of a red heifer are necessary for purifying priests to serve in a future temple. The heifers were discovered and brought to Israel with the help of the Bone Israel Building Israel organization and its team leader, Byron Stinson. Rabbis from the Temple Mount Institute approached Stinson about the unique cattle. They said, Byron, could you look in Texas and find us a red heifer? I wasn't expecting that and it was shocking to me to think about it. But I know a lot of ranchers and I know a little bit about cattle, being from Texas. And I always say yes to these Jewish rabbis because they're my friends and I love them. This began an in-depth process of finding the rare heifer that meets key stipulations found in the Bible. The Bible gives us a clue as to the significance of the red heifers here in uh, Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 and 2, where it says that God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ritual law that God has commanded and struck the children of Israel to bring you a red cow without blemish in which there is no defect and on which no yoke has been laid. So it says that we're supposed to take a perfectly red cow with no uh, white hairs or dark hairs at all and a cow that no yoke has ever been on. So as a result, it's very, very rare to find a baby cow that is completely red. We got busy. I used my technology people out of my businesses. First, we identified the type of cows that would be good. And then once we located the actual farms, we sent out messages to them and started hunting. And of course, they just wanted me to find one red heifer, but I just got committed. After I got to looking, I decided we can find more than that. And uh, so happy that we were able to bring five. The ashes of the red heifer would be used to purify water from the Gihon Spring in the city of David. Just a few ashes could purify thousands of gallons of water. That water can be then purified priests from any contact with a dead body, so they can offer sacrifice in the temple. Some Jews go every single day to a ritual bath, to a mikvah, in order to approach God in prayer in purity. However, it is not the same because we don't have the red heifer. Once we have the red heifer, we'll be completely pure and we'll be able to rebuild the temple. As I read the Bible, this rebuilding of the temple happens during a time when the world's in need for it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at that time, just as a person that's watching events in the world, that we really need to come back to our roots and back to our God. I think we're very close to that time. I really do. The red heifer must also be two years old. These cattle are just around a year old and could qualify in just over a year. So if they're able to make it without growing the white hairs or black hairs, I think with five of them we have a really good chance of that. Then they will be the first one in 2,000 years. The Jewish sage Maimonides from the 12th century said throughout the first and second temples there were nine red heifers. He said the tenth would signal the appearance of the Messiah. That's why many are excited about this arrival. What is the significance of a red heifer in the Bible? And is a red heifer a sign of the end times? According to the Bible, the red heifer, a reddish brown cow, probably no more than two years old, which had never had a yoke on it, was to be sacrificed as part of the purification rites of the Mosaic Law. The slaughtering of a red heifer was a ceremonial ritual in the Old Testament sacrificial system, as described in Numbers 19, 1-10. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its oval shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet, and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening, and the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. 
Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who dwells among them. After the red heifer was sacrificed, her blood was sprinkled at the door of the tabernacle. The imagery of the blood of the red heifer without blemish being sacrificed and its blood cleansing from sin is a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ shed on the cross for believers' sin. Jesus was without blemish, just as the red heifer was to be. As the red heifer was sacrificed outside the camp, in the same way Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Hebrews 13, 11, and 12 For the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Many anticipate the birth of a red heifer because in order for a new temple to function, according to the Old Testament law, a red heifer would have to be sacrificed for the water of cleansing used in the temple. So, when a red heifer is born, which is quite unusual, it might be a sign that the third temple will soon be rebuilt. Are we seeing any signs of a third temple being built today? And does the Bible prophesy that a third temple will be built? Here at the Lion's Gate on June 7, 1967, the 55th Paratrooper Brigade of Commander Monte Gore broke through Jordanian defenses. What happened next resonated around the world and electrified the Jewish people. As Commander Gore broke radio silence with that declaration, it marked the first time the Jewish people controlled Judaism's holiest site in more than 2,000 years. Within six days, we returned to the biblical land of Israel, all the mountains of Judea, Samaria, the Golan Heights. We returned to the old city of Jerusalem, and the city is liberated and reunited. And here we are, 53 years later, a new government, Jerusalem is united. It's fabulous. It's the Word of God coming out of the book, materializing and becoming a reality in our times in front of our eyes. Israel's victory in the Six-Day War stunned the world and became a turning point for Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, uh, God says that he's going to draw the Jewish people back to the land. But what's interesting is that at that moment, when Mordecai Gur, the, the Israeli general, was said on the radio, the Temple Mount is in our hands. When that was broadcast, not just through Israel, but worldwide, it electrified Jewish communities all over the planet. The level of Aliyah, Jews leaving their exile countries and coming back to the land of their forefathers, skyrocketed in the years ahead. Yet more than 50 years since the battle for Jerusalem, Rosenberg says Israel and its capital remain on the front lines. Jerusalem is the epicenter. Uh, for 4,000 years, people have wanted this city and they have fought hard to get it. And so the fact that Israel controls it today uh, is biblical, it's prophetic, but it's also complicated. And we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Today, we want to show you a prophetic shift that occurred when the Temple Mount came back into Jewish hands, opening the door to the building of the third Jewish temple. Some called it a kiss from heaven. On June 7, 1967, Israeli Brigade Commander Motegor made an announcement that Jews had waited to hear for some 2,000 years. Retaking this ground was important for a number of reasons. For one, it's where King Solomon built the first Jewish temple. After the Babylonians destroyed it, Zerubbabel laid the foundation stone for a second temple that was later expanded by King Herod. It fell at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD. When Commander Gore declared that the Temple Mount was back in Jewish hands, it rekindled hope for a long-awaited third temple. The Six-Day War was a miracle of biblical proportions and um, was a, um, a cataclysmic opening of a, of a new era for, for Israel and for the whole world. Rabbi Haim Richman of the Temple Institute is dedicated to rebuilding the Jewish Temple. He sees the time since the Six-Day War as a prophetic shift. It would be hard, I think, not to see what's happened in the past 50 years as a tremendous uh, jump start, a tremendous fast forward. It's, it's, um, it's more than prophetic. 
it's like a kiss from heaven, you know, it's like a divine kiss. It's an, it's an intimate brush with the reality of God's compassion and love, uh, and he keeps his promises. The Institute shares a key connection to the battle for Jerusalem. Its founder, Rabbi Yisrael Ariel, served with the 55th Paratrooper Brigade that captured the Temple Mount. After the victory, a Jordanian guide gave them a remarkable tour. His job was to carry the company machine gun. There's a very beautiful photograph of that. He actually, the first night of the liberation of Jerusalem, he, he was given the task of um, guarding over the spot of um, the Dome of the Rock, which of course we believe is the Holy of Holies. The story though that he told us is that the soldiers were on the Temple Mount and it was just like the first hour or so. And uh, they were approached by a, a Jordanian fellow in Western dress who explained that he was the official tour guide for the Jordanian parliament. And he offered to take the soldiers and show them the sites on the Temple Mount. And uh, he takes the soldiers, you know, the, the rabbi there, and he says, uh, well, this is exactly where um, the sanctuary stood. This is where the, the altar stood. And then this is where the menorah stood. It tells him all these things about the history of the Holy Temple. Finally, the rabbi asked him, why are you telling us all this? And he said, well, we have tradition from our fathers, they from their fathers, that one day the Jews would wage a war and conquer this mountain and rebuild the Holy Temple. And I assume that you're starting tomorrow. And I want this to be my part, my part in helping you. What was their reaction to that story? Well, gosh, I guess. <laughs> Yes, they were pretty surprised, but the bottom line is, in hindsight, it doesn't look like we were ready. Fifty years later, that's changed, with the Temple Institute preparing blueprints and gathering official temple elements, such as the priestly garments. Richmond is also dispelling myths about the temple on today's digital loudspeaker, YouTube. Let's start at the beginning. What was the Holy Temple really all about? All of this means talk of rebuilding the temple is no longer considered a fringe idea. Today, there is a lobby in the Knesset of how many members of Knesset that are constantly speaking about Jewish rights to pray on the Temple Mount. There are members of Knesset that actually talk about the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Do you understand that 20 years ago, these people wouldn't have been given a moment on prime time television in Israel to say these things. They would have been laughed out. So, a few years ago, this was considered fringe? Zealots lunatics, peculiar. Today it's mainstream. One of those members is Yehuda Glick. Ten years ago there was not a single member of Knesset who ascended Temple Mount. Today we have 20 of the Knesset members who are interested in ascending Temple Mount, praying on the Temple Mount, and are part in the battle for the redemption of the Temple Mount and for bringing the Temple Mount back into the center of the next, next step in the redemption process. Richmond sees the temple through the eyes of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote 3,000 years ago that God's house would be a house of prayer for all nations. It means basically that there's a God in the world and that the best is yet to come, and that we are so connected to him and to each other and to that purpose and to all humanity. And it's just a wonderful privilege to be here with you today, to be looking out over Jerusalem and to realize that we're living in probably the most important time in history. If you believe in the God of Israel and you see his hand on his people and you understand the tremendous uh, changes that have gone on over the years, you see that the one who brought us this far isn't finished and will keep his promises. Jerusalem, eternal city of God. The very word is a symphony to the ear for all to whom the Bible is precious. And at the heart of Jerusalem lies its secret, the holy temple on Mount Moriah, place of the Shekhinah, the divine presence, called by Isaiah, the house of prayer for all nations. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people have prayed to return to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, and to rebuild the Holy Temple. Today, we have returned. The city of Jerusalem is built up, a thriving, vibrant city. But what of Jerusalem's secret? What of the dream? For over two decades, the Temple Institute has been recreating the biblically appointed vessels to be used in the Holy Temple in preparation for its rebuilding. Tens of sacred vessels have been completed. These vessels and priestly garments on exhibit in the Temple Institute's Treasures of the Holy Temple exhibition in Jerusalem's Old City are not copies or replicas, but are actually fit to be used 
according to strict biblical standards in the New Holy Temple. Original source materials such as gold, silver, and copper, and the original sizes and measurements are used exclusively. Each year, 100,000 visitors come to see, learn about, and experience the promise of the Holy Temple. A visit to the Temple Institute is the highlight of a trip to Israel, for in the presence of these vessels, one can feel that the time of the redemption is indeed drawing close. The golden menorah, the golden table of the showbread, the incense altar, and tens of other sacred vessels have been painstakingly and precisely recreated. Silver trumpets, Levitical harps and lyres are ready to be heard once again in the streets of Jerusalem. The priestly garments, including the uniform of the high priest, the ephod, the breastplate and the golden crown, the result of years of intense research and the efforts of Israel's finest artists and craftsmen are on display for all to see. The Temple Institute provides specially trained guides who explain the history of the Holy Temple, the nature of the divine service, and the significance of the Holy Temple for all mankind. That's a really loaded question, man. I mean, that's not, not like a simple question. Would it change something, I don't know, to the Jews? Of course. It's a big part of, of the Jewish religious identity, you know, having the temple, the place of worship. Because it's a redemption of our, of our culture. It's, it's who we are as a people. It's, we're coming back to who we are. Everything, everything. <laughs> Just a dream that we have. We have to live the present and dream. If we don't have dreams, we don't have anything, right? I can't even answer that question. I can't even imagine it. it would, uh, I think everything would change. I'm not really sure that we even know this, really. I mean, it should change our whole level of consciousness of how we live our lives to have God's presence so visible and so clear. A lot happened this year, not just Mayron, a lot of things that just didn't, doesn't make sense. And I think it's a wake-up call for all of us, and um, I think hopefully it's coming soon because I don't know how else to explain any of it. So. Everyone will be equal and we're going to live happy in peace. The temple is going to be the greatest building in the world. It's going to be a place that will bring good to, the, to all nations. Read the Bible, it's written there. I mean, you don't have to ask me, come on. Nobody's going to be jealous of each other. Nobody's going to be poor or stuff like that. The whole world, the old world is going to be very wise, very happy very healthy. Every religion is welcome. So that's why I think that way. So you would come to the Holy Temple to pray with all the nations together? Yes, all together, all religion. It would be nice sometime in the future, maybe in Messianic times, when, uh, when everyone can pray together. We're all, we're all praying to the same God, just uh, different, different words. The world will be one, and the God's only one. All peoples come to the one. That's written. It's my belief. We all have the same God, eventually. We all believe in the same God. All the people in the world will understand that there is one God. Yeah. <laughs> מקום שכולם מגיעים אליו מתוך אידיליה ורואים בו כמקום של שלום. אין, אין, כל תולדות האנושות אין את זה. אז אתה בא פה עם איזשהו קונספט חדש. אם הקונספט הזה יכול לעבוד, אני הראשון קונה את הכרטיס VIP. דניאל 9.27 Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. The Apostle Paul tells us what this abomination shall be one who makes desolate is in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, who, the Antichrist, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Jesus further expounded on what this abomination shall be one who makes desolate is in Matthew 24, 15 through 18. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Scripture plainly tells us that when the Antichrist steps into the soon-to-be-rebuilt third temple and proclaims to be God and demands to be worshipped as God, that the Jewish people are to flee to the mountains and to do so in a hurry. The Apostle John, in a vision, again verifies there will be a rebuilt third Jewish temple, as we read in Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. The Bible clearly teaches that a third temple will be built in the future. The first temple was built by King Solomon and was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and for nearly two thousand years now it is laid in ruins, with just parts of the temple walls and some of the foundations remaining. Watchers of end times Bible prophecy have long speculated as to when the temple would be built for a third time. And now the plans for a third temple have begun. Clearly, there needs to be a working, functioning, rebuilt temple for the Antichrist to desecrate. This temple will be taken over as Daniel the prophet foresaw by the lawless one, commonly known as the Antichrist, at exactly three and one half years after the start of the seven year tribulation. This temple will not be the Lord's temple. The glory of God will not inhabit it. The third Jewish temple will be Satan's temple, in which the Antichrist will exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, 
as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless.